Welcome to Philosophy and Faith, where our goal is to help you navigate your intellectual and spiritual journey, especially in regards to topics like God, faith and doubt, meaning and purpose, and more. I'm Nathan Beeson. And I'm Daniel Jepson. And together we discuss the big questions that humans have wrestled with for thousands of years. We're glad you can join us. Hi, this is Daniel. I'm Nathan. And we have a guest here with us today. Yeah, first time. Excited for that. So we've got Dr. Justin Gash with us today. Justin, how are you doing? I'm doing very well. Yourself? Good. Excited to get into the content of today's episode. Yeah, me too. You know, this is the first guest that we have had on. Yeah. So I'm thrilled and you should be honored. I am honored <laughs> and I feel a little bit of pressure, oh, but... Yeah. Uh, We'll see. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, no pressure, no pressure. I was wondering if you could begin our time by sharing a little bit about who you are and what you do and how our interests have converged to bring you here today. Sure. I am a professor of mathematics at Franklin College. And because I work at Franklin College, my wife and I moved to Franklin in 2011. And when we arrived in May of 2011, we needed a church to make our home. And so we Google searched churches in Franklin, and the one that was closest to our house was Franklin Community Church. And so we thought, well, we'll start there. And when we arrived, we had a community that we were able to plug into right away. It turned out that a third of my department at Franklin College already attended Franklin Community Church. And that's how I, I got to know Pastor Dan um, and Andrea got to know Pastor Dan, and we met you at that time, though you were much younger. Yeah. He was you a were, kid, man. We yeah, all were. You were, yeah. you were a kid. For a brief time, you were shorter than I was, and <laughs> I'll always treasure those moments. <laughs> in terms of our conversation today, I had a hip replacement surgery in 2016. Pastor Daniel came by the house to visit me, and he gave me a book called Reasonable Faith, and he said, I think you will enjoy reading this. And so I, I read it. One of the silver linings of recovering from a surgery is that you really do have to take time out because you can't, you can't do things. So when someone offers you a book, you can read it. Mm -hmm. And I was just blown away. I was, I was blown away by the apologetics arguments. They were stated in a way that appealed to me mathematically because of my vocation I really enjoyed the systematic approach to making arguments for the existence of God. And in the case of the book, Reasonable Faith, uh, also an argument for the historicity of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And from there, I just had opportunities to integrate that into my job. We do independent studies in the mathematics and computing department at Franklin College. So I had an opportunity to have an independent study with a few students, one of whom is you, Nathan Beasley. <laughs> was, that the, was that the first one? That was the very first one. Wow, yeah, I got good memories of that. With And those conversations in my office were just amazing and intellectually fulfilling, but also spiritually meaningful. And then we developed a new first-year seminar at Franklin College, and faculty were invited to speak, to run a class on any topic they thought would be interesting. So I, I started teaching from Reasonable Faith and a few other texts as well, from C.S. Lewis and Timothy Keller. Yeah. I think it's curious, and I think a lot of people will probably like to know, all right, you're teaching a, not really a religious college at all, Franklin College is mm -hmm. known for that, and you're teaching in the math department because that's where your PhD is, and yet somehow you got approval to teach a class focused on apologetics. Was that difficult? Not terribly, no. The administration and my colleagues wanted to make sure it wasn't uh, a course that was proselytizing, mm -hmm. which I appreciate. But we're a liberal arts college, and ultimately our mission is to speak to all the ways that people can apprehend and comprehend reality. And our mathematics computing department has never been terribly one-dimensional. We have faculty who teach the history of the Cold War through board games. <laughs> we have uh, the Pixar course. We had a colleague that I'm taught sorry, can you, uh, uh, what? Uh, the math of Pixar. Oh, so okay. the cartoon company underneath the Disney umbrella. Interesting. Um, looking at the mathematics they use. Okay. In their, 
So I think what was most critical is that it was a topic that I was interested in that has intellectual value. And it was something that students would appeal to students who were coming in for the first semester of college and wanted something that they were interested in. Gotcha. So they got to pick which first year seminar course they took. Yes. We yeah. offer somewhere between 15 and 17 and, okay. and they rank order their top three. And then they, they do get an option of saying, no way, not this <laughs> course. So there's, there's one course they can just say, I don't care what the numbers are looking like. You can't put okay. me into this course. And, and it turned out that there is a, what I suspected, which is that there's a chunk of students that are really interested to speak about reasonable faith and the yep. intersection of faith and reason. Great. So I was going to ask a question related to the demographics. Of course, all the students are interested in reasonable faith. Did you find that most of them had similar religious backgrounds or similar religious beliefs even in the course, or was there diversity? This most recent time that I taught the, the course, it was fairly uniformly Christian. But the first time I taught the course... That was not the case. We had Muslim student. We had, it's tough to nail down exactly sure. what students' faiths are because I kind of steered clear of sure. in, interrogating yeah. them in mm -hmm. that regard. <laughs> what um, do you believe? Yes, and then I will grade it. But I would say two to three students who were atheist and several other students who were agnostic. And then amongst the Christians, which was still the largest proportion of the class, there were Catholics and Protestants. There were students who might be best described as not terribly engaged with their faith at the moment, others that were very engaged with their faith at that moment. And so there is a diversity. There is a diversity there. And I think what's interesting about apologetics arguments, and we might get into this later, I might be jumping the gun here, but is that even for someone who's in uh, maybe a member of a different worldview, to use the language of your podcast, they're still really relevant to understanding what it is you believe and how livable your belief system is and how coherent it is, all, all really all three of them. And so even students who began the course as atheist and ended the course as atheist still added so much to the course and I think got a lot out of the course and so it was a real, it was a real pleasure. Awesome. Yeah. Short digression. I believe you've had a promotion lately, haven't you? I, I have. I am the assistant dean of Franklin College. Now, nice. So I'm half administration, half faculty. So in academic waters, we would say that I've joined the dark side. <laughs> is the, <laughs> but I enjoy the, the half and half role because I like the problem solving of administration. But cool. ultimately... My vocation is with students. I enjoy I enjoy the classroom, and I enjoy being with students. Great. While we're on the digression of the ins and outs of your jobs, what, what kinds of math classes do you teach? Yeah, so we are all generalists at Franklin College. So essentially that means every faculty member in the mathematics and computing department can teach any mathematics course. So I teach anything from our liberal arts mathematics course that would typically be taken by non-majors all the way up through the 300 level theory courses for mathematics majors. So my particular area of interest is modern algebra, but in between LA 103 and modern algebra, I also teach calculus one and calculus two and our intro to computing course. And then when I can, a course called Theory of Computation, which is more of a computer science course, but it's theoretical. So it's heavy on the math. Gotcha. So you've taught the first year seminar a couple of times. Yes, I have. And then separately you teach a class on reasonable faith. Yes, that really focuses explicitly on the book. And by the way, I don't think we've mentioned the author of that book is William Lane Craig. Yes. So in my independent study, we spend time going through the entire text by William Lane Craig called Reasonable Faith. It's a bit dense. That would have been difficult for me to read through that whole thing and assimilate that very well. Yeah, I mean, it's difficult for me to assimilate it well, and I've tried to assimilate it several times, yeah. but uh, I'm teaching an independent study right now. Uh, which isn't actually terribly independent. It, it, it has 11 students enrolled in it. So it's basically 
just an underground extra class at that's this a, point. That's like a full size class for Franklin College. Yeah, isn't yeah, it? yeah, yeah. That's a respectable size class. Yeah. Um, but I still learn things that I hadn't paid attention to before. Great. So a couple questions came to my mind about this. Obviously, your background and your expertise is mathematics. That's what your PhD is in. That's what you've been teaching. So how does that correlate with this emphasis on apologetics? Where's the overlap there? That's a great question. Thank you. You're welcome. I usually don't get to ask a question. So. <laughs> <laughs> Probably the place to start, and though it may sound trite, is in the discipline of critical thinking. Okay. So in a mathematics class, you are analyzing the properties of objects. And so part of the discipline is rigorously defining the objects and the properties that you want to investigate and then being very precise when you do your investigations. You think critically about the scope of a particular word. You know, is it appropriate for this context? Have I proven all the necessary components in this proof? Or is my proof incomplete? Am I making, how do I want to say, logical steps that are, I don't know what the philosophical term would be, but appropriate, you know, non, non fallacious And maybe the best example I can think of that relates to this podcast and perhaps the episode prior to this one is with the Kalam cosmological argument. Uh -huh. So one of the premises there uh, is everything that begins to exist has a cause. That phrase begins to exist turns out to be critically important. Mm -hmm. And if you were to do a cursory review of critiques online, if you went to YouTube and looked at critiques of the Kalam cosmological argument, uh, a lot of the counterexamples presented would be things that don't begin to exist. You you can find examples of... Like numbers? Numbers is the exactly the thing okay. I was going to list. Um, they're like, well, you know, someone will pause it. Well, these don't have a cause, but uh -huh. they never began to exist. Right. So they're outside the scope of the premise. That kind of thinking is probably the number one thing that overlaps the discipline of mathematics and apologetics. Okay. So some of the preciseness and exactness of the terminology, you have to have that when you're talking about some of these arguments in a very deep way. Yes, I would say so. And of course, when you look at the defense of some of the arguments, mathematics comes in handy. Right. So for the teleological argument, probability theory is mm -hmm. a worthwhile thing to be fluent in. And then, of course, there's just the syllogisms of the arguments themselves. Though my experience has been that, though that's quite accessible, it's, it's when you interrogate each premise uh -huh. that the mathematics major um, or that discipline, that disposition, okay. like analytical disposition comes in handy. Great. So you're talking about the overlap in mathematics and faith and apologetics. And I remember taking discrete math with you and we worked on proofs. Yes. And we tried to logically prove certain, I don't know, what, what did we try to prove? <laughs> oh, properties about even number plus an even number is even. Yeah. Or a rational number plus a rational number is rational. I just remember the language of proving being very common. And so thinking about apologetics, do you feel like it's possible to prove God's existence with some of these arguments? No. <laughs> Is the What? Heretic. <laughs> Why do we bring this guy on? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> that completes my analysis. Uh, Next. <laughs> no, I'm with you on that, actually. But go ahead. Yeah. 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 I, I, I don't I don't think so. And I'm ultimately a lay person, so I want to make that clear. I'm I'm on a podcast with two people who actually have graduate degrees. And so I would yield to your analysis. But I would say this, it, it would seem that in order to prove the existence of God with an argument, you'd have to have an airtight definition of who God is. And I don't think we can fully capture in words who and what God is. 
if someone approached me with saying that I've proven the existence of God, I would be keen on asking, how did you capture that term? What I think we can do is a more modest approach. I'm going to answer this question from a Christian point of view. We can come to un better understand who God is by thinking, using the gifts he provides us, the ability to reason, the ability to formulate inferences from our experience. We can better understand who God is with apologetics arguments, and we can communicate some of the facets of who God is with people of our own faith and from people of different faiths and worldviews. I think that is doable. But I'm highly skeptical of the ability to prove God's existence. And I'm also skeptical of whether it would be ultimately valuable if we could prove God's existence. Yeah, I'm with you on that. But why don't you explain what you mean by that? Part of the value of faith is the choice to trust. Uh, and I may be... I'm a listener to this podcast, so I may actually be repeating something <laughs> that I learned from the podcast. That's okay. Are you going to plagiarize us? I am. So Make I give, sure you write your citations yes. in <laughs> Chicago. To oh, I'm not writing in Chicago. I'm APA all the way. Okay. Okay. That's my. <laughs> well, very, you are the dean. Well, very, <laughs> very firm opinion on that. <laughs> but it's the choice of trust that has all the value. It's not a perfect analogy, but I think of what, what's the other most critical relationship I have in my life besides the relationship with God. It's the relationship with my wife. What makes it magical and meaningful is that we choose to build a life together and we choose to trust one another. I can't prove that she's always going to have my best interest at heart, but I trust that she does. And she trusts me in the same way. And I, I think that you lose that opportunity for trust when you have knowledge. I don't trust that integration works. I know calculus works. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So that would be my attempt. Okay. Do, do you feel I like... like um, good stuff. Yeah, it's good stuff. Do, do you think that studying apologetics makes you have to trust less because you have some of these arguments for the existence of God that are reasonable and helpful? That is an awesome question, and I have not thought about that question. Wait, it's not better than my question, though, right? Everyone's questions are good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, sorry, go ahead. No, I, I, that's, that's such a great question. Or even for you personally, I mean, do you feel like apologetics has been helpful for your faith or detrimental because... Faith, when you can see, is no longer faith. Yeah, I think there's still so much, so many dimensions of God, certainly the Christian God. There's, there's so many dimensions beyond what the apologetics arguments that I'm familiar with tackle that I don't feel like it has lessened my faith. I think it has strengthened my faith in the sense that I feel like I have a deeper connection with God. Hmm. I also think it's energizing. It's an energizing thing to think about the interplay between God's creation and how I fit into it. So, for example, the Kalam cosmological argument paints the picture of not just some, not just a being in God that has immense power, but it speaks to a creator who has willed existence to be. And that allows me to infer that, hey, I'm a part of creation as well. This God must really love me, and I must have some sort of part to play. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So it, it builds the faith in that way. What it doesn't tell me is what the heck my part exactly is. Uh -huh. I have to live that out. And it certainly doesn't tell me with any kind of precision why an omnipotent power would choose to create a universe and, and that I would be in it and that you would be in it and, and all those kind of things. So We just talked about that. Yeah, so it only takes you so far. It only takes us so far. I would liken it to use some jargon from education. I think apologetics is about a growth mindset. 
And I actually did not think of that ahead of time. So I'm kind of going on a... Well, uh, let's see if it works out. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I'll give it a shot. But when we talk to our students about what we want in the context of college, we want them to have a growth mindset. We want them seeking to incorporate new information and new experiences that help them hone their understanding of the world around them. And that process never ends. If you're a lifelong learner, you're always doing that. And I see apologetics as a springboard to a gr part of the growth mindset that one has in a relationship that's building with God. And it, the idea is that your relationship with God is continually growing. Yeah. And I think apologetics have a role to play in that. One of the things Nathan and I have talked about in one of the previous episodes, I don't remember which one, but fairly early we talked about faith and doubt. And we borrowed a seven-number system of certainty. So number seven, you're absolutely certain God is this. There's not an intellectual doubt in your mind. If you're on a one, you absolutely know that God does not exist. It's not even a plausible scenario. And number six would be, yeah, you're fairly certain that God exists. There's room for ambiguity and doubt sometimes. But, you know, it's, it's a constant belief of yours. Five would be a little bit less than that. Four would be completely neutral. Three would be, okay, I don't think God exists, but I'm really open to it. And two would be probably not. I don't think there's a God. I'm not saying it's not possible. And one of the things we talked about, or at least I think we did, is that apologetics can help you get further up that scale or at least not bottom out on the scale. Because I think if you're out of one or a two, you're going to have a very hard time having any sort of religious faith. Whereas someone can be at a maybe a four or a five and still have a very vibrant faith, but they're just believing in spite of intellectual doubts. It's more of a volitional thing than an intellectual thing. All that to say, have you seen that in your own life or the life of your students, that dynamic? In my life, the answer is yes. I have seen that. I would say that for much of my life, I probably would have been about a 4.5. You have to allow me to use decimals <laughs> <Yeah>. because... <laughs> wow, math guys like to yeah. be specific. You know, <laughs> I, I, I'm surprised I, he's I, just using it to the 10th decimal, yeah, not yeah. the 100th. So. I'm waiting for a couple uh, yeah. more digits. That's right. I was, I was really... It's 1.5 pi is really yeah, what okay. I've been at. <laughs> um, okay, but, so you're at a 4.5. But I think <laughs> in, in the last... In the last decade, okay, that has increased to about a 5.5. Okay. And so you see that incremental increase, but it's, it's still modest. I, I do not think I'm anywhere near a 7. Gotcha. Um, I have seen that kind of growth with my students, but usually what I'm going for in the classroom is to convince students that belief in God is reasonable. Mm-hmm. I honestly also seek to convince students that not believing in God is reasonable. Mm -hmm. So I want to make sure that students, uh, how do I want to say, maybe make sure is either a poor phrasing or a shortcoming of mine pedagogically. But I am wary of one and seven on that scale. Mm -hmm. It's hard to grow, grow if you're in those spots. And, and in my experience, I, I think students who are believers in a, a Christian or Islam or Jewish worldview do get something out of the critiques of the apologetics arguments. They typically buy into and subscribe to the apologetics arguments, but it matters that they can see where doubt might arise. Mm. And for those of an atheist worldview, or I think the worldview you're using is philosophical naturalism, which would adequately describe, I think, all of the students I've had in my class who were atheist. Yeah. I've seen the growth in them accepting that a reasonable person could accept the premises of these arguments, that they're reasonable. Okay. I, I like that you said you're wary of one in seven. I feel like personally, it's a question of intellectual honesty. When you're talking about God, who, as you mentioned before, is, it's hard to really specifically define what that is or who that is. It would, it would be extremely hard, I think, and intellectually dishonest for somebody to suggest that they have absolute certainty. The seven. I think the seven would be 
And I think the seven would be particularly difficult for somebody to ascribe to. Or at least they haven't heard some of the counter arguments or are maybe really young. I don't want to be insulting, but you know what I mean? I'm going to push back on that a little think bit. think so? Okay. Well, you have to remember that there are different ways of knowing things. And a lot of people have such direct experience with God or some sort of supernatural thing in various ways that to them it is a kind of self-attesting knowledge. They have a almost a direct, immediate experience. They have a story. And people are wired different ways, so maybe for some of them, they could be a seven, not because they've examined all the arguments and have come to that place, but it's more of an intuitive thing. Yeah. But I could be wrong. That's actually a really good pushback. I think I'm thinking in the realm of if you've looked at some arguments, maybe you're more analytically minded. I think it would be hard to be able to prove God's existence from from one of these arguments. Mm-hmm. So that's a good point. And well, well taken. It does, it does speak to uh, the question of what we mean when we talk about knowledge. Because without question, when I answered that last question, without question, <laughs> just roll with it. question. <laughs> anyway, um, when I answered that last question, I was thinking about my role in the classroom, right? And, and in that sense, the, the discourse is primarily intellectual. Right, yeah. But I would certainly say earlier, I, I made a comment about how I don't know intellectually that my wife has my best interest at heart. But if you asked me with a different sense of no, like, do I know? Uh-huh. I, oh, I know. I know 100% that she's yeah. got, because of my experience in the marriage relationship, mm-hmm. I know. I have complete confidence in that. So ironing out what knowledge we're talking about or what component yeah. Well, this is where I yield yeah. to people who have actually had philosophy courses. Well, there's a really beautiful overlap here because we're talking about how helpful apologetics can be and philosophy can be to help support the faith. But in the Christian perspective, not about knowledge about God. It is about intimate knowledge with God, just like you described in your relationship with your spouse. So apologetics do help, just like knowing about my wife can help me. But knowing things, knowing facts about her is not, it's not the point. Let me ask you this, as we're still talking about the classroom, and you've gone through this book with them. It's a substantive book. It's a little bit challenging. Have you found that there are some sections, though, that the students really resonate with? And then part B of that, are there some that really resonate with you more than others? Yes and yes. Okay. I'll start with part A. I would say the teleological argument. Why don't you summarize that because not everyone may be familiar with it. Absolutely. So the premises of the teleological argument are the universe is either due to necessity, chance, or design. The second premise would be it is not due to chance or necessity. So the conclusion would be that it is due to design. Nice little syllogism. Why, thank you. I did not invent that syllogism. (laughs) And so they, that appeals very, very strongly. And I think it's because we live in the 21st century and our scientific explanations of not only our world, but our universe weigh heavily on students. And unlike the content from several other of the traditional or mainstream apologetic arguments, they've had 12 years of education so 13 if you include kindergarten, talking about science. So in the teleological argument, the scientific literature and analysis really works for them. And they deeply question whether if by chance, based on the scientific descriptions of the material universe, if the universe would spring into existence and would actually still exist And they see no reason to think it's necessary that the universe exists. So they find the argument compelling that it is from design. Probably the second most is the Kalam cosmological argument. Okay. We talked about that in our last episode, if people are so interested in going deeper. Yes. So for your students, either the teleological argument or the Kalam cosmological argument. And then how about for yourself? The moral argument would be my favorite. Okay. And I know we've got 
some discussion about that that you're going to kind of walk us through a little bit from your perspective and from teaching that. We're already a half hour into this episode. Why don't we call it a day for this episode and then come back and the next episode we'll talk more about that and we'll let you explain why this argument speaks to you so much, maybe develop it a little bit, hear some counter arguments and then how you might respond to that. Does that sound good? That sounds like a plan. All right. So for this episode, just want to thank you again. This has been really fun. It's fun for me to be on the asking side. It's fun, isn't it? Yeah. (laughs) So thank you again, and we'll catch you here at the next episode. Thanks so much for listening. If you like what you hear, click follow or subscribe depending on your platform. Check the notification bell so you're up to date with new episodes and leave us a review. Until next time.